I want to thank you all for being here. I'm usually very much impressed with an audience of one, but you all are doing pretty darn good. Uh, I had the pleasure of hearing one of your most distinguished gentlemen that is sitting in our office, our, 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 auction, our front seats and so forth, and that's Mr. Bob Bruner up there, and he is the champion gunsmith, the fellow who built a Hawken rifle that is now residing in Jefferson City as the historic rifle of Missouri. Let's have a hand for that man. Thank you, Bob. The history of the Hawkins shop, and, and I'm coming into the 1900s, not the 1800s. Jake and Sam had their shop down by the river, and uh, Greg will tell you all about their history. I'm going to tell you about my history. Back in the 60s, and that's the 1960s, by the way, even though I've only got seven more, more years until I'm 100, uh, I still work 24-7, and I'm vertical, so if any of you have anything you want me to do, I'm available. Um, I have a shop called, can you hear it? How's that better? Okay. Now, I, I can talk like this. Can you hear me like this? Is that better? Worse? Acoustics are not tremendous. Acoustics are not tremendous here, so consequently. But just go like this, and I'll try and make it louder. I had a, a business in St. Louis called Antique Arms. And a gentleman by the name of Stanley Platts and I had some fabulous collections of firearms from Winchesters and Remingtons and whatnot that we showed and, and sold and, and so forth for a number of years. I had an antique dealer in St. Louis, uh, Zern's Antiques, called me one day and said, Art, I got something you got to come over here and look at. So I hustled over and he handed me a brand new looking Hawken rifle. It was an old gun, original gun from the family, and it was the most gorgeous thing I'd seen. Well, I knew a little bit about those guns, never owned one, but here one was standing before me just in all of its glory. And I said, okay, tell me the sad news. And he said, there's no sad news. He said, it's bargain to you, it's only $1,000. And this is in 1950, 60 period, you know, that's when you eat beans for a month or so for that kind of money. Anyway. I said, well, give me a minute to think about it. So 10 seconds later, I told him, I'll take it. Anyway, I took that back to the shop, and I thought, man, that is really beautiful. I love it, and I caressed it, and played with it, and set it for it. And lo and behold, what happened? About six or seven months from that, a movie came out called Jeremiah Johnson. And uh, Robert Redford is in the snowy banks and so forth, and all of a sudden, here's this dead man with a gun still in his arms, and he reaches over and pushes that thing out and looks at it and he said, it's a Hawking rifle. Well, then the world knew what a Hawking rifle was. So, before long, as long as that information was out, we had Thompson Center and, and Alberti and all these Italian names coming out with what they call the Hawking rifle. And I said, well, this is a bunch of BS. We might as well capitalize on this. We're the only ones that will make one that own one. So I had probably was blessed with the forerunner of Bob by a fellow by the name of Keith Neubauer. And Keith was a fabulous, fabulous gun restorer, refinisher, and just a peach of a guy all the way around. And he said, Keith, can you make us take this gun apart and mic it and do whatever you need to do to give us the parts so we can build a gun like this? He did. And the gun that he made for me that we could copy all the parts that we could give to him so we could reproduce an original Hawken rifle was born. Now if you want to come down there, I've got that prototype that's laying on the table and uh, you can shed a tear here and there and, and feel it, what, it, what, it, what it really looks like or feels like. Over the years as I had that gun, it, 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 it was like um, I guess some of you girls in your little black dress and some of you guys for, for the first Ford that you owned and you fell in love with that thing, you just love to hear it purr when you turn the key on. I felt that way about the gun. When you live with it, you love it, you, 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 you really are tied to it for the length of time that we were tied to it. It comes to you in, in a different way. 
Uh, thank God I had a little bit of English. I, I was an English major, and, and so that came in pretty good. And I sat down, and when I did, the words to this poem just jumped right off the pen. So if you bear with me, I know this by heart. I lay in bed at night and talk about it. But when I come to the back end of it, there's one thing then that I don't do, that I do now. I choke up at the end. So if I have a problem with it, <clears throat> I want you to understand it doesn't come from my throat. It comes from my heart. And the poem is Old Thunder and Me. It's a saga of the Hawking Rifle. It starts out, when I, once I got my mind on straight and figured what it's at, I kicked the traces of the east with just my coat and hat. I heeded Horace Greeley's words because truly they seem best, and I set my feet ahead for the gateway to the west. Now, when I hit St. Louis town, I didn't spare a cent to outfit with the very best because I was sure hell-bent to be the best damn mountain man that ever bore that name. So to the Hawk and Gun Shop eventually I came. Their rifle's reputation was a legend all its own, a gun so true and sturdy, sure the finest ever known, so rugged and so beautiful, the best that they could make was that big bore half stock cap lock made for me by Sam and Jake. It took me barely but a week of working every way to learn that rifle in and out, because sure enough, someday I'd call upon her talent in some moment of true strife, and there'd have to be that knowledge if she were to save my life. Her happy voice in times of fun would crack a cheerful sweet sound, but her words of fear or anger would shake the very ground. A half an inch and then some was the measure of her bore. Just to face that awesome cavern would have chilled you through the core. Now I perceived a friend so true should surely have a name, a title that would tell the world that she was far from tame. Old Thunder, sure that fit her fine. She'd answer to that call. Old Thunder will do very well and lightning be her ball. The years were hard, but good to us. I guess we'd shared God's grace because many times I nearly saw the old Grim Reaper's face and more than once we cheated death or evened up the score by some help from the Almighty or Old Thunder's mighty roar. And now my time for out is past. My eyes are growing weak. My voice, what's loud and laughing, is just a whisper when I speak. The world no longer knows us, old thunder and her friend, and I fear the times we once knew have come sadly to an end. I don't regret the things I've done, <laughs> and Lord knows that's a heap. And I sure ain't one to ask for much. I've always earned my keep. So please, dear God, do grant me when I hear the angel song and face the happy hunting ground. Let thunder come along. Okay. Are you going down now? Uh, yeah. No, I, yeah, I think we'll. Okay. What? Are you gonna no, stay I'm, I'm going to stay up here with you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's hard to follow Art because every time he gives this talk, it's different. But I will go with the story that, that he <laughs> sold the Hawk and Shop to me on. Um, I've been blessed and lucky to own the Hawk and Shop since 1990. Uh, we bought it from Art and moved it from St. Louis out to Washington State. But our intent in owning the Hawk and Shop is to pursue the history of Samuel and Jake Hawken and, and do it through their half stock rifle. We don't do anything, I mean, we have a few other sidelines, but as far as Hawken goes, we build one rifle. It's the classic Plains rifle, half stock, 54 caliber, and someday we're going to get good enough to build a gun like Bob does. So I'm not going to go into the gun too much. Uh, Bob is going to give a lecture at four o'clock and tell you what it's about, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of, of the Hawken and the Hawken name and, and how it is today. Um, Hawken is a family name. And in today's world, Hawken is a generic rifle style. Well, that's incorrect. Um, Jacob and Samuel Hawken, brothers, uh, Jacob came to St. Louis in about 1818, Samuel in about 1822, and they come from a gunsmithing background. They both had experience at um, Harper's Ferry. Their father was a, was a gunsmith 
there were a few other gunsmiths in the family. Uh, they got together in St. Louis and formed their Hawken business in 1825, which is part of our celebration today, going up to next year, which is going to be the 200th anniversary. So they they built guns, they repaired guns, they did a lot of a lot of different things. One thing they didn't do was trademark their name. Remington trademarked his name, Winchester, Smith & Wesson, um, Colt, all these people trademarked their names and they're known as a brand today. Hawken didn't trademark their name, it became a generic term, but it is a brand. Um, so Jacob, Jacob died in 1849, leaving, leaving the business to Samuel Hawken. So J&S Hawken guns were basically marked J&S up to 1849. After that, they were marked S. Hawken, primarily the half stock classic planes or mountain rifle. They did make what was called a sporting rifle, which was a smaller caliber, lighter rifle. And Bob, do you have one or two up there on display? So if you want to see a variation on the Hawken rifle, go up there and, um, and look at the sporting rifle and you'll see quite a difference. Um, but don't miss the display no matter what, because it's a once in a lifetime uh, to be able to see this many good guns in any one place. So anyway, Jacob died in 1849. Samuel continued the business. Now, Jake and Sam were businessmen. They owned a gun making uh, entity. They did not physically do all the gun building. They had employees. They bought their parts at various places. They rifled some of their own barrels. Uh, they, they pretty much assembled guns as opposed to being a gun factory that built gun after gun after gun that was the same. So almost every Hawken out there is going to be a little different. There, there isn't any. There's, uh, there's attributes to the guns that are quite similar and, and it points out what is a Hawken rifle, but there'll be little nuances that are different in each one of them. So anyway, in, in, uh, Samuel continued the business up until 1858 when he got out of the business, went to Denver with his son in the interim, the Hawken business was kind of in a flux um, by um, uh, William Watt and a few other people that tried to run it. But in 1861, J.P. Gimmer bought the Hawken shop or the Hawken business, and he ran it until 1916. Now, just to go back a little bit, uh, uh, Samuel Hawken was very, very big and instrumental in the volunteer fire department in St. Louis. And that, from what I've read and what I ascertained, was actually a bigger love than the livelihood he made um, uh, in the gun business. Uh, Samuel was known to hang around in the, in the firehouse up until at least 1882 when he gave his last interview. Um, I think Samuel is more famous than Jake because we know a lot more about him. We've got photographs of him. We don't have very much written on Jacob. Nobody has a picture of him. Um, it's kind of a mystery out there. And as much uh, research as we've done, and my wife does, we haven't gained uh, or garnered a whole lot. Does anybody out here know Jacob, Jacob Hawkins' daughter's name? Jacob had daughters. And it's something we're looking for right now, just as a curiosity to see if we can follow it up in the, in the St. Louis history. So. I expected Bob to have that right on the tip of his tongue. Okay. So, so anyway, J.P. Gimmer continued the Hawken business um, up until 1916 when he retired and he closed the business down. So Hawken, the Hawken business was gone. Now in 1970, Thompson Center Arms decided to produce a half-stock muzzle-loading rifle. I don't know how it happened. I can imagine the barroom scene that they had that somebody said, let's go, there's a Hawken. And people said, what's that? And said, well, they, they built good guns back in St. Louis and the, and the name's kind of known. And Thompson Center said, good idea. We're gonna call our half stock rifle a Hawken rifle. That got the name going. Somewhere around that time, this gentleman was already involved in, uh, back up a little bit. He ended up with the Gimmer estate. 
I'm not sure how it happened by hook or by crook, but Art ended up with the Gimmer estate, Gimmer estate, which included the remnants of the Hawken business that J.P. Gimmer ran. So Art put the business back on the map. Hawken was, again, a generic name, so he trademarked the name The Hawken Shop with the reopening of the Gimmer business and the Gimmer Hawken business. Uh, like he said, in 1972, Jeremiah Johnson came out. Um, John Milius, who did the screenplay, did a pretty good job of including the Hawken rifle in his screenplay. The guns he used in the movie were lousy and had nothing to do with Hawken, but that's a whole other story. And um, Hawken is mentioned four times by name in Jeremiah Johnson, and the whole thing exploded. Hawken, Hawken again, became a household name. Art kept the integrity of the Hawken history intact by going to the lengths that he did to create this half-stock rifle. We're still using the tools. We're still using the, the rifle that he generated uh, back in the 70s as the product that we have today. So if you want a product that bears the Hawken name that is lineal to the direct uh, uh, Hawken shop in 1825, we can provide you with that historical product. We only put the gun out in kit form. Uh, we have some builders that do a very good job assembling the kits, but I'm not here as a sales call. I'm really here to, to just talk about the history and let you know about Hawken being a family name and a brand, a brand, excuse me, a brand compared to what Traditions, Pedersoli, Thompson Center, everybody is calling a Hawken rifle. So anybody have any questions? Any comments? Yeah. Art has a question. Just wanted to mention, the advent of the gun that we produced was to copy the gun that I had purchased, which is indicative and classic of what we call the plains rifle. Because the caliber was large, the gun was heavy but durable and practical, and it was for deer and buffalo and big animals, rather than squirrels or, or whatever, and they did make those rifles earlier for in the Lewis and Clark, right after the Lewis and Clark period, and, and so forth like that. So what you actually get from him, which came from us, is a Hawken Plains rifle. It's a classic gun that was owned in style by the most famous of the late fur trapper, early buffalo hunters that you will ever find. A gun that Bob builds to the nth degree. Okay, anything else? Bob, you want to? What's that? You probably couldn't believe it if you heard it. So, <laughs> Art, do you want to repeat what you just said? They couldn't hear you. Oh, that, that, that. Here. Oh, there. I love you all. <laughs> what, did, what, what did you want me to say? You couldn't hear the poem? No. <laughs> oh, you couldn't hear what I had to say about the, the Hawken? Oh, the, the one that we built that he classifies out right now is a classic gun. I mean, it is, it is the epitome of one style that they made which was recognized as being the best by the people that owned it. I mean, the, 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 the names that are associated with a Hawken rifle that was of note that are into the almost seven figures now at auction were owned by the finest of the, of the, of the people that, of, of that era. And so uh, I don't know the name. Name some names. How many? Bob, Charlie. Oh, people that owned the gun. Uh, Kit Carson, uh, Jim Bridger, uh, Mariano Medino. There's, there, there's a lot of uh, famous people. Most of them, I think, had the Hawken rifle later in their career. They didn't necessarily drag them through the woods and, and cross the plains. But um, very, very well-known people that, uh, uh, of the fur trade era that had these guns. Yeah, very good. That cut. You got anything to say? Because you know about as much about these as we do. I'll have enough to say later. Four, four, <laughs> oh, four, right. four, four, four. Don't miss, don't miss, don't miss that. 
Yeah. Because he his direct association with the collection that's up here, which is utterly, you'll never hear it any place. You'll never hear it any place else. Okay. <laughs> I believe it's under the foot of the Eads Bridge right now. No, but there will be somewhere because we're going to, since it's now the gun of Missouri, it will be written up and it'll have the, the uh, uh, Convention and Tourism, the Hysterical Society, and every place else will have information and literature, plans and poem and everything else to capitalize on the fact that this is it and it's why it is the gun of Missouri. Seems to be a lot of, I know Richard's a roadside marker, that's why I'm wondering yeah, if you're going to. Yeah, you do. Most of them are, are captains, so forth and so on. This police officer was killed here on the major, on the major highways. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord has watched over this progress all the time. And there's no other way to explain it. It was meant to happen. It was meant to happen the way it did. That's why this gets to me. And that's why it came from my heart and from the pen in order for you to understand a bit about it for those of us that love it. There's a man that loves them, I guarantee. The men that are upstairs, Greg Grimes and the owners of some of those guns, that's big money, people. To own one of those is big money. You've got to love it enough to put out a lot of hard-earned dollars for them. Um, your question was... Oh, the, the Gimmer stuff. I, I'm in the shop one day, and this guy comes in and says, Hey, Art, did you know they're having a sale over in Webster Groves? There's a bunch of, of, of gun stuff over there that you might be interested in. And I said, well, well, yeah. I said, what is it? I said, I'm only into the older guns. And he said, well, there's some catalogs over there from Winchester with a guy's name on them is J.P.H. Gimmer. I said, what? That's J.P.'s son who worked for Olin over in Alton. And, and, and for the Winchester people. And I I had about a dozen of his catalogs. I had the Hawkins stamp. I had the Gimmer stamp. I had uh, everything except the lathe that they used for turning or the, the, the duplicator for their stocks. I had I had uh, everything there. And I owned five original Hawkins rifles and sold them before I ever started collecting them. I kept the first one that I had. But when I'm... When I'm uh, when they're offering me, you know, I paid a thousand dollars for my first one, and after five or ten years and so forth, I'm off with fifteen thousand for them. They didn't last long in the shop, and uh, they they just had a Hawking rifle, uh, not really a typical gun that sold up at Rock Island Arsenal for over a hundred thousand. So when you play with that little gun that we've got down there, you can feel the history that you should be able to feel the history that's that's in it. <laughs> did, did the Roosevelt gun sell, or is it still on auction? What, what, did, it, what did it sell for? I heard what the two forty. Two forty. Wow, that should have been six figure gun, seven figure gun. To answer your question back there, the barrel making machine is the rifling machine that belonged to the Hawken brothers. Is where now? Fred? The it's in the historical society. Art. Balcony. So, Art, Art did not have that, but and, and you have to pardon me for referring or uh, deferring to, to to Bob and Art. But I'm from Washington State, and what's happening here in St. Louis, I'm not privy to. So, yes, it's an alien. <laughs> It's speculated from what I've seen about 3,500. And there's there's a book out there by Charles Hansen Jr. called The Hawken Rifle, its place in history, which has a lot of facts, figures, and numbers like that. It's pretty dry reading, 
unless you want to look at the ins and outs of the of the business. Do you have any idea how many are in existence or don't pay? No, because they keep popping up. Pardon there? Everything, it, everything I've been associated with and have been around the barrels have been marked. Uh, S Hawk and J and S Hawk and some of the locks are marked. But um, I, I don't know of anything. And Bob could, again, he's a collector, could tell you more about the authentication of these things. Uh, there are certain nuances about the guns that you are. Every screw on an original, every screw in an original Hawk and rifle is slotted fore and aft. There's a little fill in the front of the rim, uh, the under rib that was a lead fill on the early guns. And it goes on and on and on. And as I say, I talked to one of the finest gun makers of Pennsylvania guns and Tennessee guns and so forth. And I asked him, I, I said, would you, Bob, Bob, would you, not this Bob, another one, would, would you, would you, make a hawk and rifle for me and he said absolutely not and i said why not he said because i build the finest kentuckys i can but i've got a lot of leeway one way or another for the different things that were done to him and he said if you build a hawk and rifle it's either a hawk and rifle or it's not a hawk and rifle and he said i don't want to put my reputation on the line for that and well, thank you so much for coming to this, and I want to I want to thank the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association for um, sponsoring this event, the Gimmer Muzzleloading Rifle Club for putting in all the work, uh, all the legwork, all the labor to make this thing happen, but especially to Bob Vote and to his lovely new bride who allows him the time to do this. Uh, I think without Bob, that the last three years this wouldn't have happened. Uh, he seemed to spend 365 uh, days a year, 24 hours a day on it, and he, he is the factor to make this happen, and we look forward to next year when it's going to be our 200th year and uh, better yet. On the poem, I didn't mean to say anything about it. I, I, I love it and so forth, and, and the rest of you, I hope, enjoyed hearing it. I do have copies of it that are like this. The horse writer here holding a gun was painted for us by David Wright and David the artist is down there in our place you can get him to sign it and I will sign it and the cost is a donation to the Gimmer Club Help me, Daddy. <laughs> and if you want to there's an original Hawk and rifle down there for you to shoot and shooting blanks but the Hawk and shop I have have this gun has been restocked. It's not pure, but it's pretty close if you want to shoot it. Thank you. Know, I feel a lot better today than I did yesterday. Oh, I was wiggly wiggly. You're doing good. Well, thank you.